Mana hua heta pua matu ate kore, mana hua heta pua matu ate po, mana hua heta pua matu ate au, mana hua teta pua matu ate hawa, mana hua teta pua matu ate aroha e. Mana hua teta pua matu ate ike, mana hua teta pua matu ate mana, mana hua teta pua matu ate toa, mana hua teta pua matu ate tapu, mana hua heta pua matu ate pononga. Mana hua heta pua matu ate hine, mana hua heta pua matu ate manua, mana hua heta pua matu ate aroha, mana hua heta pua matu ate wairua. So beautiful to have you, and I'm so grateful for you for connecting with our community. Mm, yeah, honour everything that you are and everything you've fostered in terms of your own mahi and what you bring to the world. So you're a therapist and a rites of passage facilitator and a Maori healing practitioner. So many different um, pathways for us to travel down today. Ah, ko kaitahu, ko waitaha ka iwi, ko katihawea te hapu, no otipoti te whanau o toku mama, no uh, poihakena, um, Sydney, te whāna o toku pāpā, e noho ana Hawaii nai mm. I mostly work with people when they're going through transformation or big change, that groundless space or the space where something's being called forth. And I think right now we're in a big time of the unknown, so we're in this collectively, but those initiations are something that we get faced with or confronted with throughout our life and places where our ground gets really shaky. And mm. so... For me, it's, it's really a path of listening and supporting people to, to be able to come back into that knowing that they hold and to be more comfortable in the unknown and also for what is coming through from that place, you know. Um, and we're, we're in a world where I think we're all bridge people. Our tūpuna always were as well. We're always holding two worlds. And how do we get really clear in what's being asked of us and to have that internal ground especially more and more as there's so much external stimulation and I had a lot of identity shifts when I was younger Mm -hmm. um, and starting off as an athlete and then uh, breaking my back and having a lot of injury and fighting the medical system from about the age of 15 to 26 where they Mm -hmm. told me that I had to have a surgery and feeling like in my whole bones that it was incorrect, like to remove my thyroid or to operate on something. And so just continuing to look beyond what I was, what I was feeling and then finding my, my way through that healing. And for me, um, Te Ao Māori has been something that's been in my life since I was a child, even though I wasn't surrounded by it physically. And, and so seeking those komatua and those queer out, when I changed my position from the whole athlete scene, it was really that who we think we are and all all that accomplishment falls away. Just really wanting to work with people in who they are beyond, beyond all of that. And then for me, that really led into, into taking people into the, into nature and for multiple days at a time and going into the silence and finding our connections and our, our relationships. So it was interesting because I I focused as a therapist, as a psychotherapist on trauma. Mm -hmm. And um, what I was finding is that there is so much in the body and the body as, and as, as a field that we walk with, there's so much information, you know, we walk, not just, we walk also with our emotions or they drag us along and um, in how we stand, how we approach everything, even the weight that we carry. And I don't mean physical, just watching what was happening with with trauma work and dissociation. And um, so I was really called to motor healing for how powerful it was. It is mm. to, uh, to release. And what I love about it is that, again, we so want to wrestle and understand things with our mind and, and we can get stuck in those the torrent of those emotions. And so often someone's done a lot of emotional work on something and then through Romi Romi, it can lift off in a way that then they can actually, it's like it's, um, it's separated from them. It's externalized a little bit. And so it's not as close uh, mm-hmm. to home and then they're able to complete that process with it. And then, and likewise, if someone hasn't done any emotional work, it sets it up for them to, 
to then be able to engage in a different way. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. I love that, that grounding. Um, I guess that's part of like the midi midi at the beginning of sitting with someone. And I really, you know, everyone needs to own their healing. Healing's a choice. Um, yeah. We open the body up for what it wants to heal. And I really believe that when someone books into a quest or they book a session, it's already begun. Mm -hmm. And so even what, what comes up for them in the lead up and in their dreams or just even in the synchronicities of their life, the conversations, for them to be able to just take a sort of 360 degree view on their world and voice what's going on and look at the pieces. And it's almost like being able to I think of it as um, putting a, like seeding the table for what it is that they're, they're ready to do or ready to let go of, or it could be a question that they've been holding and it could be a question they've been holding for some time or something that's just emerged since, since they decided to come in, but it's really their own whole process. And so I've, I find there's a lot of power in verbalizing it. So that's probably the therapist counselor part in me that um, really wants the other person to own, own that piece, but um, they've, they've made a claim or a commitment to something. It's something in that openness and that vulnerability. And so then, in, and then in the body work, I find that it does actually allow a deeper surrender. And it also um, brings up for me that there is a tremendous amount of trust that people place in healers to know that it is them and their tupu not doing the work, um, but also to feel connected to me being in the room as a support and just allow that, allow that peace. To, to take place mm -hmm. mm, yeah totally resonate with that it's, it's like a sense of the mahi working the best when they're fully in the embodied in the decision to shift that yeah. and then how would you describe um multi healing or me to people who haven't connected with it before uh, my experience of of multi healing which is for me a lot to do with how we hold stories in our bones and also in the stone um, which is why, you know, we turn to Ponamu uh, or our Monga. And yeah, we walk with all this information with us in our body and in our field, our ancestry, our family patterns. And so the body basically uh, is constantly talking to us and wanting to, wanting to be our deepest ally. So it'll, any pain or discomfort has behind it this deeper need or this, this yearning. And so that it's really about listening to that and moving that it does clear back as well as clear forward. So, you know, I really love when like mums and daughters or Fano come in and, but regardless, we're often such victim to our family circumstances. And so just that healing in Te Ao Māori is always about the sovereignty of what I can, what my choice is to do right now. And also that it has this effect both back and forward doing a lot of family therapy with healing that as soon as one person makes the shift, the whole system changes. Mm. And, and you wrote an interesting thing, which I thought I had made up, <laughs> which I've never heard anyone on your form. You wrote um, gateways in the body or portals in the body. Well, um, my, my teacher, Atarangi Muru, would talk about it as the haimata, the haipuru, and the different gateways. And um, what I experienced is different points lighting up in the body in that humata in that scanning and and i think it's similar to in many uh scientific or western modalities you know with kinesiology or anything that there's actually ages emotions stored in, in points in points mm -hmm. in the body and, and that there's actually a system or an order mm -hmm. in which that will move or that wants to move we if we come in with our agenda uh, we get blocked. So to really to listen to those those entry points or those gateways, and they show us, you know, the the way to clear. Yeah. Um, I also find that it's connected to the stories, so images and family members back, you know, that they may not have have physically met will will arise at certain points, mm. and so often there is a there's a storyline that is sitting in that place, and also has a wisdom to offer forth or. Um, a calling because I think um, when I think of it as a gateway it's also like the different dimensions it takes us to so you mm -hmm. could well, when I'm watching it's like could be pushing on a the physical body but I'm not even on the physical body like I'm off somewhere else but that's the doorway that I need to travel through somehow yes. yeah, yeah so it's this beautiful yeah, map map that's um, 
And I, pro yeah. I probably got it from Atarangi, but it's in either, to, you know, it's like in, um, integrated within me. <laughs> and then I didn't yeah, realize exactly. she taught me. <laughs> ancestral blessing when we connect or when we listen. And I really feel this, that all healing is really listening. And same with stepping out into nature or um, embracing the silence and listening or listening to the body that that's when we allow that ancestral blessing to come mm -hmm. through there's a lot of mummy or pain in our in our lines and we often in those pudaka or those stories it actually is the humanity in the stories that has a, has the greatest humility and gifts for us it's not mm -hmm. you know it's not the story that is just um just the strength those podaka change form and shape as we engage with them more and more and allowing them to have a different layers that's similar to the healing journey. It's like, as we expand our vision, the stories change shape. Yes. <laughs> yes. In the creation chant of that, we're only given in our hands what we can carry at that time. And so that knowledge comes in and then it leaves and we can't hold you know, and hang on to it all. But so like those tall who come and it opens to something and suddenly that story lights up some pathway in you and it connects all these dots. But you, you probably, if that had passed your way before, it might not have lit up those pathways at that time. Mm -hmm. And so there's this, it's that living constellation that we are in the, in the way that knowledge or understanding comes to us. And yeah, healer is such an interesting term, but I think it, 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 it's something that is just, that comes from, having sat with people through things and knowing that in those situations, I move in to sit there. So I think it's just the natural pathway for, for people and that it's not about having an identity of the role. It's just that it's what you, your whole system knows. Yeah. So it's really that transition that we go through when we move from one stage of life to the, to another or when our identity changes or our behavior changes, we, um, when something changes and we see this in healing work, you know, that when something changes, it's like there's a part of us that needs to know that something happened, something took place. And so rites of passage is often an intentional, intentional way to mark, mark that for ourselves. And whether we do that with ceremony or whether we do that with a silent action and it has witnessing and whether that witnessing is, uh, the supports that you call in, in terms of your spiritual family or the landscape or your community. Um, but there is a, a confirmation and with that also comes like a new responsibility or a new way, losing a family member or, you know, losing a job and, and things falling away and, and these sort of catastrophes where we're not who we were before. And so it is another way to look at trauma as well that, you know, we cannot, backtrack and, and that's such a part of the rite of passage that we there's a moment right before the threshold where we like we know what's going to happen and we just want to go back and then there's this sort of realization that like I can't go back even if I if I wanted to and we step in into into the experience and yeah and we're not the same afterwards and so that needs articulation or an understanding mm, um, yeah one foot in each world um, yeah. and and then what led you to um, place the hero's journey into a heroine's journey? And can you describe that journey for yourself in terms of creating that? Yeah, there is a couple of female authors who have written up the heroine's journey. Interestingly, Joseph Campbell, who wrote up the hero's journey, he, it was actually bought by Hollywood and a whole, <laughs> because part of it, even though it came from this sort of timeless cycle through cultures and, different landscapes it's it's what we all move through and when he was asked why is there no heroine's journey he actually stated that the wahine didn't need to go out and seek in the same way that the man did part of it part of the there was a lot of pushback for that but part of it is that you know as women we go through cycles every month we go through death and rebirth and the deep feminine and i'm not putting this on gender or sex but the feminine goes inward to find out and the masculine does need to seek and find and bring something back and the way that i work with it has a lot to do with how we reject our feminine in this current world and we over identify with the masculine of having to to prove ourselves 
one of the statements for for the young girl is that she either wants to be liked by the man or like a man okay. and just you know how we how we kind of sacrifice that to fit in or, and and how we reject like our mother to to touching back on that yearning that we have for the feminine and what that means to each of us um, and integrating our masculine and our feminine i um facilitate the heroine's journey with my mother mm. And so we do it as a, an eight or 11 day, um, in, you know, quest with women. We've done it on a very remote island in China with women from all over and we've, and here in Hawaii. And yeah, just, I think the first year, no one knew we were a mother daughter team, but we were definitely working the material. And I'm just grateful to her for that. That's what we do as healers. If we speak outside of something, it doesn't reach anywhere. How powerful to do that with your mom? What is your view on potential like re-traumatization from this time that people might be experiencing? Um, I actually feel like everyone is being given their perfect storm right now. I keep sitting with the question that there's nothing wrong. I think for a lot of people is that are being stripped away of who of many parts of our identity in terms of the world that we have we have worked so hard at in terms of the life that we've created and earned and these long 10 year plans that we set up. And, and so there's an unfairness in the field or a, a fear of um, wanting to return to life as normal. And um, I come back to Joanna Macy speaking about, you know, that we're in the great turning and to hang on to life as normal would be to deny reality. When we deny or reject our experience, we always cause more pain. You know, we have to begin by embracing our current experience, even if we don't like it. Mm-hmm. But only through that do we get shown how to be. And then we can start to feel really connected and capable again. I think, I think that actually all humans have trauma. Mm-hmm. And we are, it is hard to avoid ourselves right now. It's like a, a revealing time. Yeah, but it, it is definitely taking taking us inward to things that maybe we have been asked for our attention for a long time and then the biggest thing with trauma is obviously like how do I stay present and grounded and and in my body and and it you know what I'm hearing from a lot of people is that they have nowhere to go to and so they're having to like emotionally regulate in these small spaces so it's it is a it is like a really um pressurized test right now it's a beautiful gift as well for for us to learn how to yeah regulate on that level yeah, we're going to emerge a much stronger and families will emerge much stronger. And I'm aware that there are families out there that, are, uh, that, that it's a lot harder for. It's, I think it's very hard for us to set up space to actually listen to ourselves. And silence doesn't always look like silence, but it's where everything external quiet, quietens. And I sometimes think about it as like, you know, if you've ever been diving where right when you're on the surface of the water, it's really choppy and then you drop down a, a meter and it's calm and the further down you go, it, the quieter it is, but also the quicker you move in that tide. And so how do I get into that place for myself? For me, that's been probably the most consistent <laughs> practice for me of the ways that I can drop into that listening. And um, I see that a lot in the rites of passage work with youth, you know, that they're, they're being asked of all these things and they're just a great metaphor to look at because we all have that teenager in us that looks for this outside validation and wants that confirmation and is wrestling with decisions. You know, I, I used to find decisions would just like freak me out. I could not handle decisions until I started to actually find a way to to get in that quiet place where I could genuinely ask and also be willing to hear the answer Mm -hmm. and, and just learning like what the difference in, in that voice that comes, you know, how do I even know that that's that, that true voice and where do I feel that in my body? One there, the pitch of that voice or what that voice sounds like, it never says anything. It can be very direct and cutting, you know, it uses for me, that voice doesn't use extra words. It's always kind. Many people have a different place in their body, but there's a place in your body that you feel it. Yeah. Whereas doubt or like the opposition or whatever you want to call it, um, that wants to sort of challenge and test us, it has a 
a different feeling depending on what our strong sense is, whether it's hearing or a felt sense or, yeah. So I think that's a great question for people to start to tune into what that feels and sounds like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and for me, at least it's really subtle as well. Like, even though it can be direct, it's subtle. Um, it's not noisy. Um, so that's why it needs the silence to really hear like, whereas that, that agitation feeling is actually that cognitive dissonance or bodily dissonance that's happening where something's not right. <laughs> so it's like <laughs> try, trying to feel through that um, feeling. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's a beautiful way to describe it. And it can just be nauseating and mm. so, so um, anxious to sit in that place, especially when we feel an urgency. And I think part of it is that we feel like that fear of fucking it up you know, it's like actually um, a fear of abandoning ourselves. If we make the wrong decision, you know, more often than not, when we choose because of we choose based on an external piece or a relationship, something that we want to hold on to, we abandon ourselves. And that's like the deepest pain of all. It's the deepest loss. And, you know, we can feel it in our body, the weight of that decision, even though we can't understand it with our mind because we're not used to choosing what's true regardless of what it what consequence it will have you know we want to we want to hang on to our attachments it's a hard weight to be in and mm. it reminds me of like um kyamo kyatsukuna like what i what i hold on to and what i give and that our whole our whole body has this metabolism of constantly you know receiving the nourishment and and releasing the things that don't serve us but we confuse that, like in our mind, we confuse it and we confuse it in our energy and our emotions. So we often hold on to and carry a lot of things that are old or even dead. And we even carry, you know, people along with us and things that have hurt us. And then we also give ourselves away or even push away and reject the things that we don't like, that, that fuckatoki of, of what do I really want to hold in my hands and what is really time to release and how do I um, move through the confusion of that? Even if I'm carrying, I'm trying to carry another person and myself, I'm not serving either of us. Like how can I actually fuck a mana, uh, uplift everyone out, the other person that they have their own, you know, that out of the deepest respect for them, they can handle whatever is also true for me. We had the opportunity in January to watch you mahi and do a session. How do you feel when you're in that flow of doing a, a Māori healing session or a Rumirumi session? You know, it's funny because through this quarantine, I haven't been um, doing that mahi until the other day and I had missed that state. Mm. It takes over and I am, there's a part of me that is not, not there, um, even though it's, it's a polarity because you're so present. I often feel so blessed at meeting the tupuna or the kaitiaki that come um, with someone and just being witness to someone entering their healing in that way. And even when someone can, you know, articulate what is most needed for them, you can just feel how that has already shifted something. The attunement of that is hard to describe, but um, I'm actually loving working online. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> how it just crosses out any limitations so I'm really loving the intuitive reading and counseling online mm. and um, and we have a, a nine-month rite of passage training coming up for people that want to be facilitating ceremony and rites of passage and I think there's something really fascinating about sitting with people all over the world in this intentional way and asking these deeper questions and we're all in an existential uh, turning right now mm. <laughs> super grateful for you and um all that you share and exude and it's felt on every level Thank you.